We live in times where darkness approaches from all sides. God's creation, his precious children, are under constant threat of isolation, despair, and a lack of purpose. But Jesus called his church the light of the world, a city upon a hill, alive with the fire and power of the Holy Spirit. Together, we can fight the darkness. Together, we can beat back the shadows. And it happens through the simple act of invitation. An invitation can rescue the isolated, connecting them with a loving, devoted community. An invitation casts out despair, replacing it with joy, peace, and salvation. An invitation can guide those seeking purpose to the ultimate mission of God's kingdom, a lifelong journey of growth, outreach, and service chance to change the world. In this season of Christmas, it begins with a simple choice. To let our light shine. To make an invitation of hope. So we begin this sermon series that will be for the whole month of December, simply entitled Good News. Everybody say good news. I think we need some good news. We're surrounded by bad news. Just watch the, the news every evening or if there's cable news. People, some people say fake news. We get news from the governor or we anticipate about a vaccine and all these notifications that come on our cell phone. But I also have a, maybe a requirement that I need to tell you. It's now that we're in December, you're allowed to listen to Christmas music. All right, before Thanksgiving, it's illegal in most of the states. I saw a meme you can't listen to Christmas music before Thanksgiving. Do you hear what I hear? And there you go. So, During the month of November, we had a co-drive. We kind of joined in with the township of Isham and the police department. And I'm here to tell you, Marlton Assembly of God, the people were so generous, we gave over 300 winter coats that will be distributed. Um, I, and, and by the way, they're trickling in. They'll still take them, but it's kind of over. But if you have some, you know, maybe by tomorrow, if you want to get those in. But uh, it'll probably be around 325 coats will be distributed in Camden, New Jersey. So we're excited about that. So thank you for your generosity. And thank you, AJ, and your wife, John C., for leading worship for these last couple of weeks. And Will and Megan online, our online church community uh, they went to Michigan, and that's one of the states that uh, makes you quarantine for 14 days or whatever. So uh, they're just doing the right thing. So we miss them, and they'll be back next week. And I want to encourage you to be with us this Wednesday for our United Prayer Service as we call on the name of the Lord. Now, Luke chapter 2 talks about good news. And when we get to verse 10, I'm going to ask that you would just say it as loud as you, you can. Through your face mask, you'll read verse 10 together. But Luke chapter 2 and verses... Um, Excuse me, verse 8 through 14 is our scripture this morning. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, let's read this together, ready? Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. The angel said, do not be afraid. And a lot of people are fearful. They're fearful of coronavirus. They're fearful of getting sick. They're fearful of dying. And the Bible says, do not be afraid. I have good news. And just so you know, you say, is this for me? It's for all people. 
So I present to you in this whole month the good news, the gospel. The gospel of Jesus actually means good story or good news. As a way of definition and introduction for this month, this is the gospel. The gospel of Christ is the good news that Jesus Christ gave his life to provide forgiveness of sins and salvation to all who believe in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried and he was raised on the third day, also in accordance with the scriptures. A free gift of God based on faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ who died on the cross and he rose again. It's the good news from God. It's from heaven to earth for us today. And I believe with all my heart that the Lord is telling us to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Not just come to church, although that's very important. And by the way, if you can't make it to church, there's no judgment or condemnation. But the Lord is asking us, Marlton Assembly of God, to share the good news. During the summer, they said, take time to disciple your people. Share uh, the strength of God's word and really disciple people. But now in December especially, tell people the gospel and encourage people to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And we did that through global ministry, global uh, the mission celebration, and now locally through coach drives or whatever means possible, share the message of Jesus Christ. You say, how do you do that? During this month, I want to share with you how to share your faith. Very practically. Number one, just like the video, invite people to church or invite people online. Invite people to the message of Christ. Now, I just want to tell you, if you get involved in sharing the gospel, this will be the most exciting time of your life. This will just energize you because you'll be involved in God's work. It will touch your heart and it will touch all of eternity. Matter of fact, it's just not exciting for you. The Bible says there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus calls people to himself. He called the disciples. And this is what the Bible says. When people get called and follow Christ, it will be a natural response to share that message with others. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. Watch this. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and we brought him to, to Jesus. Jesus looked at Peter and said, you are Simon, son of John. He goes, I'm going to change your name. You will be called Cephas, which means translated is Peter. All because of one man by the name of Andrew said, Peter, come, there's this Messiah, this Jesus, and Peter's whole life was transformed because of Jesus Christ. But it took one man by the name of Andrew. Andrew's name means manly. And let me just suggest to you this. Whether you're a man or a woman, the greatest thing you could do as a human being is invite people to Jesus Christ and let Christ transform their life from the inside out. I was running... And by the way, this is my story and probably a lot of people's story, at least Americans. I struggle with my weight. Ever since I hit 40 years old, I just struggled with my weight. Like most men, it goes right to my gut. So about a year and a half ago, I lost 40 pounds. So it's kind of a health journey that I'm on. But do you know in the last eight weeks, I put on like 12 pounds and so I'm back to running again. I hate running. I don't think it's spiritual. It's just not my thing. But it's my only way, you know, so I'm trying just to, you know, I'm kind of working through it. And behind my house, about a half a mile away, is called, if I have it right, is, is it Black Bear Run Preserve? Is that, I say it wrong every time. What's it called? Black Run. And it's all these different trails. And so I just kind of hit the trails that kind of, it's easy on the knees. There's all these pine needles and all that. By the way, I don't like running. It's just I have to kind of move my body. And so I was running a couple weeks ago, and um, I was noticing that there was some, and there's all these signs that says you're not allowed to ride mo motorcycles or any, any, any motors because it ruins the trails. And, and I, was, I was running, 
And I was noticing these two men, and they were very distinct. They had these hats on, these vests on, and they were cleaning it up. And the guy just got my attention. He goes, oh, man. And he, he kind of stopped me. He goes, we're asking people not to ride motorbikes back here. And obviously, I don't ride a motorbike, but it was destroying the pathways. And these men were, you know, kind of cleaning the trees. And he introduced himself. I can't remember his name. And he goes, what's your name? So I'm kind of running, but I'm, now I'm stopped. And he, he was kind of dressed in a certain way. He goes, I'm an ambassador for this area. We don't use that word too much, an ambassador. We talk about an ambassador maybe from the United, UN or maybe going to another country, a political ambassador, one who represents power or the will of somebody in authority. And he said, he goes, I'm an ambassador for this area. I'm supposed to keep it clean and move all the things and please help, don't let anyone ride the motorbikes. He was enlisting me. And without even thinking about it, I said to him, I'm an ambassador too. I don't even know why he said it. I never used the word ambassador. It's actually a biblical word. This is what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. He goes, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. If you're a believer, that we reconcile people to God. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Everyone say ambassador. As though God were making his appeal through us. God calls us, people that will be involved in sharing the faith, the invitation, you're an ambassador. It's at the highest level. It's higher than the White House or any political party or a king or, or a lord, or a governor. You are representing Jesus Christ himself and you're bringing people to a holy God, sinful man to a holy God. And through the person of Jesus Christ, you're you're, you're kind of bringing these two people, God and sinful man, together, and you're an ambassador. And out of my mouth, I said, I'm an ambassador. And he go, he's real, now he's real interested. He goes, who are you an ambassador to? Like, who do you represent? And I never said this. I probably never said it again. I said, I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And he looked at me like I had five heads, like, and really, I'm telling you, he wasn't interested or not. He went back to moving the logs. And I just got running again. Never saw the guy again. But that's what the Lord invites us to be a part of. We are now his voice. We are his hands, his feet. We are his workmen. We are his witness. It's the most manly, godly, highest level of humanity existent is to invite people to share the gospel. We are enlisted by God. We are now in the Lord's army. We put our feet together and we say, yes, sir. Lord, how can I serve you? How can I invite people to God, not only go to heaven, but how do I invite heaven down to people's hearts? And I want to just kind of walk you through some practical ways you could do this as God's people. And if you're online, you could say, I, I want to be used by God. I want people to go to heaven. I want to have spiritual conversations. I want, how do I do it? Now, you know I'm just wearing a, a Marlton Assembly of God sweatshirt. Pastor uh, Christian has one on. Maybe some other people do too. Uh, Glenn, you have one? Glenn, Glenn Needs has one as well. You say, why do you do that? Well, let me just tell you this. We don't make any money on it, but we have them for sale in the, in the lobby all this, all this month. It's, it, it, it's a little colder outside. Maybe you want to represent too. Um, they're $40 each. We don't make one dime on it. But for everybody... Watching and an 11 o'clock crowd, we're just going to run a deal. I'm just going to call an audible real quick. If you buy one right now, well, actually, you buy two, one for 40 or two for $80, we'll send that out for today, all right? That is for today for everybody. Just take us up on that. But, you know, here's a simple thing. We, why do I wear this? This is kind of like you can almost dress up and preach a message in it. You could also wear it to the gym. But what I'm do, why I do it is just because I'm God's ambassador. It's just, a, it's just a conversation piece. So if I'm at Aldi's or I'm getting my tire fixed or I'm at the grocery store or Walmart, wherever I'm at, people, they, people look at your chest. You, or, you know, you got the, uh, the mask. I don't know how long we're going to be wearing these masks. If Biden definitely becomes the president, it looks like he's probably going to be, unless Trump can figure out something in these last couple of days. He wants us all to wear them for 100 more days. Probably for the six, next six months, we're going to be wearing some type of mask or whatever. I'm not saying you should do this. All I'm saying is a talking point. 
People see the M. Hey, are you from that church? And all of a sudden now you have a, a conversation. You're representing the Lord and his church or whatever. You know, a lot of people won't come to church. They don't feel comfortable. They're sick or whatever. I don't feel crowds or whatever. I don't think everybody kind of is consistent with all that stuff or whatever. But you could tell, hey, why don't you, why don't you watch online? Just invite people into the process. Invite people to church. Do you know Christmas is the number one season that people actually come to church? Pastor Adam said, and by the way, if we have to have a third service, I guess we'll take a third service. But the number one service to invite people to through the whole year is Christmas Eve. It feels good. It's the spirit of Christmas. You light the candle. You know, you, I just want to encourage you, whatever it takes, by any means necessary, just be an inviter. Now, we did a survey like three or four years ago. And if you don't know my story, I was up in Newark for 13 years before I came down here. And actually today begins year number 14 for Miriam and I down in Marlton, New Jersey. Can you believe it? 14 years. Some days it feels like we've been down here for 40 years. Other days it seems like 14 days. But it goes quick. And we did a little survey of this area. This area religiously is kind of has a, a background of a, a Catholic area. But there's three ways or three kind of, a, by the way, how we ministered and loved people up in Newark is completely different than down here. Wonderful people, not better or worse, just different in our expression. But there's, there's three things about this area. We, after our survey, sports, education, and kids. Let me say those again. Sports, education, and kids. This is a very sports-driven area. People love their sports. Probably too much, but people love their sports. And that's kind of part of the reason why we built the field house. Here's my deal with the field house. I don't even like soccer. I don't even I don't like playing it. I, I don't like what the score is one to nothing. All right, who cares? I think they should make the goal like real big, 50 to 45, and it's good. Like keep it. I'm a movement guy. But listen, if if you're talking to somebody in your life that likes sports, you could actually say, Have you heard of the field house? Oh, you gotta go to the field house. You like soccer? Even, even I don't even like soccer. Just talk about, oh, you gotta come check our church. What you do as an ambassador, you're just trying to connect. Just over, you get a relationship going. You get a conversation going. People love education. Around here, people are really into education. You, if, if you have little kids where, hey, have you heard about Marlton Christian Academy? Everyone wants to get their kids a head start. Have you ever noticed like the God of this world is like little kids? Like the parents running around behind the kids. How many parents say to their kids, oh, my kid's the smartest. I'm looking at the kid. No, no he's not. But everyone thinks, everyone thinks that, right? But people love their children almost to a fault. Like it's an idol. And then, and then finally, it's, it, it, it's, it's sports, it's education, and just generally their kids. Kids and youth. And you can, you can talk about the church. Oh, Marlton, man, they got great kids ministry. You know, every service we got ministry. Right now it's kind of awkward. Whatever, but you, you got to get your kids and your youth in a program. It really helps their kids. You can start having conversations and introduce people to church and to Jesus in that type of way. And listen, these are just some ideas. And maybe God could use your gifts and talents, your voice. Maybe you have a house, a shore house. You have a, a job, whatever. You know, you have something going on. And you, that becomes a kind of a talking point. You know, you're doing work in your yard and some of the men come around. You, all of a sudden you have an audience. You have a network. You have people. God wants to use you. To open up your mouth. It's not just Pastor John. We thank God for Pastor John. We love Pastor John. We acknowledge he's good looking. Son, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is God wants to use you. And you, you might be just like sitting way back and say, God, use me to share the faith. And the answer is absolutely 100% yes. It's the most exhilarating time that you will have in your life. You're flying at a different level. You're, you're, you're flying at an eternity's level. You're being used by kingdoms. And listen, I'm just giving you some ideas, but just remember this. You and I aren't doing the work. What's really happening is God is doing it. The Bible says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. God is at work, and he's drawing people. God does not want one person to die and go to hell. So he's doing a work in their life and God uses people, me and you, to be a part of that process and to bridge the gap. We're ambassadors. So look for the activity of God. God's at work. Even during coronavirus, he's working. 
I mean, if you kind of eliminate distractions in your life, say, okay, God, I'm available to be used by you and your thinking invitation. Who can I reach? Who am I working on? God, what are you doing? Like, who, who keeps walking around my block? Who just moved in? Why am I keep bumping into this person? Why does this person ask for a ride home? Why does this person seem to be going through a hard time? Whatever it is, God will use your head and your mind to reach souls for Christ. But it's God that's working. You and I can't heal anybody. You and I can't save anybody. You and I didn't die on the cross for anybody. We sure didn't rise again from the grave. We're not at God's right hand. It's Jesus. It's his power. Now, today's culture, you know this, people are on edge. I mean, people are like angry. Here's my second running story. I had to do a lot of running. I ran 275 miles in the month of August. That's like running to Washington, D.C. and back. So I run about two, three miles a day. Almost every day I'm running a 5K. I don't know why. I just, I want to lose 10 pounds. I don't like running. The other day I was behind the sanctuary. They have all running trails over there. I'm running. Early in the morning I'm running. And all of a sudden, there's a dog, like right on the thing. His, his master, the man, he has the dog off the leash. And I'm running. I'm not paying attention. All of a sudden, he's like 20 feet there. And it's one of these dogs that goes. <laughs> and I'm like looking at it like. That's how people are today. You start talking to people. You just disagree a little bit with social media. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, we have a problem here. I'm like, this is it. I started calling my wife. So listen, I love you. Take care of the kids. All, all of my financials are in the thing right there. You got it. And this guy was trying to, you know, he's trying to get the dog. The dog kept moving forward. And, and I didn't know what to do. So I started going. Sometimes when you start sharing the faith, it will feel like people were like. But you don't stop and say, oh, no one's listening. And you just kind of go pack it in. Nope. You just kind of wait for that situation to die. I always ask permission. Can I pass now? Make sure he really has the dog, and I just kind of keep running. You get good time when the dog's there. Like, you're like, you get to go, you just start moving. Sometimes the people that have the biggest bark are the ones that need Jesus the most. The world kind of, right now, people are on edge. You notice that, right? They're still kind of on edge politically with the mask. Man, we, the stuff that people put on social media, it's a little disheartening, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm on this, like, this little app for the, it's called Neighborhood, whatever. And one person put on, everyone's kind of talking. It's like people, like, four or five streets away from you. One person got all mad because, I guess they're mowing the lawns early in the morning, blowing. Everyone's, like, yelling at each other. I'm like, really, guys? Really, this is what's going on? And the world will, but God's people, we kind of overlook that, and we keep moving in Jesus' name. Amen? So I, I encourage you, the first thing to do is just be an inviter. Just look for different ways. What are people interested in? What's happening? You build a relationship. You start a spiritual conversation. Maybe it's simply like, you know, like and share. Or maybe you're here in church. You say, I really want people to come to my church. You take a picture. You take a picture. Walk around. Hey, this is a picture. And it becomes personal. You don't have to like and share everything we put on. We're not perfect. But say, this is what God's doing in my church. And you make it personal to you. Second thing is this. Not just invite people, but be a genuine friend. Listen to this. Some men carrying a paralyzed man on a mat tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on a mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. These guys, man, they, they were great friends. They maybe tried to give him medicine. Maybe they tried to heal him. Nothing would work. But because they were such great friends, they brought him to Jesus. Some challenging situations, couldn't get close to Jesus, so they figured out a different way, lowered him down into the roof, and Jesus healed them. These are different days. We got to think creatively. We got to do things different. We got to ask God to lead us by the Spirit. We need to be empowered by the Spirit. We can't do it in the flesh. God will help us. Jesus is still alive. He's working. He's saving. He's healing. But we might just need to go in a different way. And part of that's just being a good friend. Listen to this. Most men on planet Earth don't have a good friend. 
I don't care if your buddies, your bros, pals, dogs, cats, whatever you call it, but most people don't have somebody in their life that they can really rely on. Take it to the grave. Let me just give you a couple things about being a genuine, true friend. If you'll do this, I guarantee you'll have ministry opportunities in your life. Guarantee it. You won't have a problem being a friend. You'll always have people around you. You'll have ministry opportunities. You just have to tie the, here it is. Now, I'll give you four quick little things that will help you. Number one, be available to people. Listen to this. A friend loves at all times. Compared to maybe blood, a brother is born for adversity, for a time of adversity. The American family is destroyed. Let me say that again. The American family is destroyed. It's hard to find a good marriage, good kids. It just seems like Satan is just running rampant on the American family. It's hard to find a good model. It's just messed up. Satan loves to destroy people's personal lives. And the Bible says, if you want to reach people for Christ, be his ambassador, love people all the time, even on people's worst days. If you'll be there for people on their worst day, you'll be a good friend and you can share the gospel. Let me give you a couple examples. Every married couple, and this is hard, especially if you're young, will probably fight at some time in their marriage and probably say some things they wish they didn't say. If you'll be there for people on their worst day, you'll be a good friend. Most people have kids. And by the way, I have some great kids, but they're not perfect. My kids aren't perfect. I mean, I'm a perfect dad. My wife, no, I'm, no, I'm just, no, but there's no, do you know God loves people on their worst day? God loves your kids on their worst day. Maybe you're a Christian parent and your kids have gone the way of the world. You say, does God care? Or maybe you have some guilt about what's going on. God loves your kids on their worst day. Or maybe you've done some stupid stuff in your life. Maybe you turned to violence and you hit somebody or hurt somebody. You say, man, John, if you knew the stuff that I did, or maybe when you were younger or by yourself or you were alone and nobody else knows about it, God loves you on your worst day. And if you'll love people and care about people on their worst day, you'll be representing Christ in that moment. And people are going through some tough times right now. And if we'll be there for people in their worst day, you say, why are you treating me so nice? Why are you being my friend? And you're loving me no matter what, because I am representing Christ who loves us so very much. There's nothing you could do to separate yourself from the love of God. Think about how much God loves you, how bad we are sometimes, and God still loves us. And if you'll love people at their worst moment of their life, you're going to be representing Jesus Christ. My heart was blessed at the United Prayer Service. There was a lady who sat or was at the altar lifting up her hands. And I said, what do we need to pray about? And she said, pray for me. I have an enemy. None of us Christian people want to say we have enemies. But the reality is we have a lot of people that we don't like or maybe don't like us and we become enemies. You ever notice that? And I'm like, that is a really good set. She was actually praying for her enemy in a public environment. I said, praise be to God. Ladies and gentlemen, if we will love God and love people with all of our heart, no matter what people go through in their marriage or their kids or their worst days, whether they take drugs, if they're confused sexually or whatever's going on, if they're Republican or Democrat, whatever, if we'll be there for people, even on their worst days, we'll make ourselves available. Now we'll have ministry opportunities. And we'll just love people. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. People are messed up. Let me say that again. People are messed up. But God loves people so much. And if you'll just be there for people and just bless people, encourage people, help people, lift people, God will give you opportunities to serve him in great times. Number two, confidentiality. Listen to this. A gossip betrays a confidence but a trustworthy person keeps a secret. Not only do men not have friends, they don't have people they can really talk to. Do you know a man that's trying to do the right thing? He feels like he has the weight of the world on his shoulders, trying to have a marriage or a relationship, trying to take care of kids or something. 
trying to balance the money or whatever, and they feel it upon their shoulders to be successful and to move forward, and meanwhile, we have no one to talk to. There's some of you in the room, but there's other people. There's about 50 men on this planet that I keep your secret. I'll tell any man, if you want to tell me a secret, now listen, if you killed somebody, I can't, you have to go to the cops. There's a couple things, like if you do violence against somebody, I can't keep that confidence. You have to go, and I can't do that. But there are men, about 50 men, I did up in Newark and here. If you have something inside of your heart or your mind that bothers you and you need to get it off, you need to talk to somebody. I'm not a counselor. I'm not here to fix you. But the Bible says, confess your sins one to another so you may be healed. And once you confess, and it could be a sin that you've committed or maybe someone's committed against you. Do you know one out of four one out of three girls have been sexually molested now, and now they're saying one out of four or five boys have. So things that have happened to us in our child, child years or young people years, things that maybe we've done or whatever that bothers us, no one knows about, or maybe a few people or something's going on in the family, something you put into your body or mind or someone you visited, vacation, whatever. You have this, and you're walking around with the weight of the world. Nobody knows about it, but God has a solution. You don't have to carry that any longer. There is a release when you let it out to the right person. You could be that right person to somebody. Have you ever noticed this, that most people like to talk? What one thing, and by the way, one of the things that I found during this whole COVID thing, especially after the George Floyd thing, the race issue, it runs deep. Maybe not for you, but for it runs deep. And what I have found during this season, and I feel like just common sense or just being a good pastor or being a good friend. What do, John, don't talk so much. Just listen to people. Most people want to talk. And what I've learned, don't talk. Don't try to win the argument. Don't try to be right. Don't try to convince people to be Republican or Democrat. Most people have already made up their minds on that stuff anyway. Just be there and let people talk. If you'll keep your mouth shut and let people talk, you'll be a great friend. Don't try to correct them. Just, just be there for people. Most pastors struggle with this because we're kind of paid to tell people what to do. This is not a time to tell people what to do. This is a time just to be there for people and say, hey, what's bothering you? What's on your heart? And if you'll just give it a couple moments, it'll come rushing out. And maybe you're here today. You need to talk to somebody. You need to find somebody that you trust. If you don't trust them, don't tell everything. But I'm just going to tell you, working with people, people have stuff in their heart and in their life, and the moment they can like, let it out, God can then begin to start healing them and giving them the grace that they need. There's a God in heaven who cares deeply about people. He values people. People matter to him. And if you are a gossip, and somebody tells you something, and you go start telling other people, you just lost that friendship. You lost that opportunity. The Bible says gossip is like choice morsels that go down into a bee, and it messes with people. We're like the TMZ TV show. Hey, did you hear? Hey, you know, this person got off the, the plane at JFK and all this stuff. And, and you go talk. I mean, could you imagine? Like, I'll just pick on you, AJ, for a second. Let's say you just tell me something, right? Something happened in the parking lot. Hey, Pastor John, something happened in the parking lot. And I immediately turn and say, hey, Pastor Christian, you're not going to believe what happened in the parking lot. The best thing would be, AJ, what happened? Explain it again. Let's go out there together and deal with it. Now we've brought healing and restoration and resolve to it. The moment that I bring it over there, I'm in the middle of it. And it's eating away at me. I like being, some people just like to have all the knowledge and all that's going on, all the juice. They want to be part of the meat. It's like Arby's. We have the meats. You know what I mean? You got, you got the whole thing going on. And God says, no, we're the peacemakers. You just kind of squash it in love and grace and we keep confidence. Listen, if you've ever had a friend and something bothered you and you could tell them and they help bring restoration, healing, grace, forgiveness, whatever you call it, you are a very lucky person. If you have a friend, you're a very blessed person. I'm not the best pastor. I don't think I have all of the skill sets or whatever, but I'll be your friend. I'm not trying to be weird. I'll be your friend. 
I'll encourage you. I'll love you. I'll try to push you in the right way. I won't be weird with you. I won't violate you. I won't touch you. I just, in the world that we live in today, it used to be that pastors and priests are way up here. Now they're like way down here. If you want to minister Christ, you have to be available and be trustworthy and keep a secret. There was an older couple. They both had passed on, used to attend our church. Mary, if I would tell you who would you remember, we went to a funeral together. I think it was in Collingswood. The older couple started attending our church. They were in their 80s. They were probably with us for two years. And their kids were like in their 50s or 60s. So there's an older couple when they passed away. And we're sitting there at the funeral. There wasn't a lot of people at the funeral. But they had three or four kids. And they all got up and they were talking how great their parents were. And this is what they said. We never heard our parents talk bad about people. Think about that. All of you have opinions. You're smart. Sometimes I think we're too smart. But you're going to get in the car and go home. You're going to drive. Why is Pastor John making us wear masks? And your kids hear that. Hey, did you see that one person or that kid or whatever? And we just get talking about all this stuff that really is just kind of nonsense. Or you can almost flip it. Wasn't that a great song? I mean, AJ had leather pants on again. Wasn't that great? I mean, isn't that amazing? Someday I want to wear leather pants. I mean, like, I mean, the whole thing. All I'm saying is, if you're, and some people get it kind of really weird. They say, well, I don't gossip. But they will come back around and say, I don't know why people keep coming to me. Because you like to listen. And those people are more dangerous than the people actually talk. And you, every, as soon as I said that, everyone thinks of somebody. And if you don't know who it is, you're the problem. All I'm saying is this. If our goal is to share the message of Jesus, and we're way up here, we don't have time for this. So you just kind of say, hey, this is life. This is what people do. I'm not going to repeat everything that everyone does. The Bible says don't even mention what those people do. That's why if you're watching garbage on TV and all this garbage there, don't even listen to that. I don't have time for that. Okay, that's what sinful people do because they're sinful. But we're about Jesus. Moms and dads, I just encourage you. It's okay. And the more you're a friend, more people will trust you. You remember Nicodemus? He came, the Bible says, and he was religious. He came to Jesus at night. When people come to you at night, you're on to something. You're on to something. People will confide in you. People will trust you. They'll trust you with money, your integrity, your character. They'll open up. People are dying for meaningful relationships. They're going to tell you too much. Sometimes people say, they tell me way too much. How much in their bank account? And stuff. I'm like, I'm not letting. Nope. They're confiding. There's something deeper. You don't know what's going on in people's lives. They only tell you what they tell you. But if you listen, they'll open up. They'll share. And I think God's people right now need to be a friend to this community. We need to be available. The police ask us to read like, jackets or coats for kids. Yes, we're friends. We're friends with the world. We're friends with sinners. We're available. We're going to listen. We're going to be available. And we'll keep a confidence. I'm almost done here. I'll get you out of here by one, two, three. Number three, real quick, patient. Fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. Remember Jesus is dying on the cross? The guy on the right cursed Jesus out. If you're really the son of God, save yourself. Jesus could have got down on the cross and just started beating that up. Do you know who I am? I mean, respect all over. Every man wants to this respect, and we're really to fight and blow. Jesus, the first guy, overlooked an insult. I mean, God in the flesh. I mean, think about it. I mean, could you ever think about Jesus and his, his humanity? Like, did Jesus play kickball? Did Jesus run? Did he play soccer? I mean, could you imagine Jesus, like, playing soccer and someone tripped him? And Jesus gets back up and he's staring at the guy. I made you. Think about his humanity. Jesus was a person just like us, without sin. And he overlooked an insult for a greater good. The guy on his left, he says, we're getting what we, our sins deserve. And Jesus said, today I'll remember you in paradise. But if you get caught up in the foolishness of the world, winning arguments that we so want to, we miss out on salvation. 
If you are a Christian, a follower of Christ, you will be misunderstood. You will, be, you will have to overlook the confusion of the world. It takes time to develop a relationship. We say, Jesus, I'm all about you. The world doesn't get it. They might even make fun of me. You go to church twice a week. You tithe 10% in this economy. Wait, the church, they speak in tongues. What is that? Our message is about Jesus, and he can help you, and he can save you. It's all about Jesus. It's never anything about but Jesus. You say, why would we go through all that? Because this guy on this side goes to eternity. Heaven for all of eternity. Amen. And then finally, compassionate. Listen to this. Like one who takes away a garment on a cold day or like vinegar poured on a wound is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. I would call it this, compassionate or considerate. There are people, the Bible says, who have heavy hearts. And some people who have no clue, they're not... They're not smart with other people. They're not considerate. They're just like bull in a china shop. They do whatever they want to do. And they come and sing a song. They just try to get people out of their funk. You know what you need to do? And by the way, it can even happen in church. You might be here and you're depressed, discouraged. There may be somebody right here you feel like committing suicide. And the more we sing like joy to the world, you're like, I don't have joy and I don't care about this world. You might be like, hark the herald angels sing. Like, I don't even know what hark means. You're just mad. You're frustrated. You don't like living. You want to just kind of go back the way of the world. You say, where is God when I need him? And the Bible says, if you approach somebody who's really going through a hard time, they're discouraged, depressed, they're suicidal, it's like you're taking a garment on a cold day away from them or you're pouring vinegar on a wound. When people are going through really down and maybe they're wrestling with their faith or they're real discouraged or maybe they're just using curse words. Like, screw this. I mean, they're just, they're just like, where's God? And they're just mad at God. The Bible says, don't fight it. Just give them some space. Just be compassionate and considerate. They're having a hard day. Because if you start bringing God or Jesus or whatever into that, and especially when they don't want to, and you just keep driving it, you're actually doing more damage. Whenever it's God, it flows. Whenever it's the flesh, it's forced. And sometimes, and by the way, I'm a police chaplain in the township here. We, we have rabbis, you know, priests and Pentecostals. It's like a joke. Hey, the rabbi, go into the, you know, anyway. They said, listen, don't talk so much. Because what we do is death notifications. It's the hardest thing. This is the hardest thing. My phone was blowing up this morning. The rabbi actually responded. I can't tell you how many people are overdosing right now. People are turning to alcohol, drugs, their daughter, uh, she's dead in Camden or whatever, and they want us to go with the police to deliver the news because the policemen don't want to do that. So... They teach us, they taught us. They said, listen, let your words be few and just, it's called practice the presence. Just be there for people. My, my aunt had that, Aunt Gloria. Let's say someone's husband is in surgery. My Aunt Gloria, if you put her behind a microphone preaching, that was not her thing. Her knees would shake, that's not her thing. But she would go to the hospital with the wife and just sit there and not say anything. When people are going through really difficult times, you know what people need? Just to be there for them. And I just want to tell you this. I don't know what you're going through, but Marlton Assembly of God, we're here for you. I can't go home with you. I can only be appropriate and love you, but I want to tell you there's a God in heaven that you do not have to be alone. And if you're hurting, we are not trying to jam religion or God down your throat, but I do want to tell you that there's a good God in heaven who is full of grace and full of mercy, and that's what we all need is grace. And that's why we don't force it. You can come in. That's why we don't force it. Everybody needs grace. Everybody was born into sin. Everybody is a sinner, and we're saved by grace. And if you're here today, say, Pastor, I'm hurting, I'm broken, I'm fearful. This coronavirus, I'm barely here. You've come, and there is good news that's found in Jesus Christ. And whatever your situation, there's a good God in heaven. I'm not saying we're good, we're not the best people on the planet, but we're trying to be, and this is a good church. And you say, Pastor, I want ministry. 
I want to I be part of what God wants to do. Or maybe God's speaking to you that God can use you, not just Pastor John. I've got enough on my plate. I don't need more. But I believe God is telling us, you, the people, he wants to use you outside of the church. You say, God can use me? Yeah. You can invite people to online, come to church, or you could just be the very best friend to people. And when the time's right, you just interject it. You just turn the conversation from sports or weather. When the moment's right, you'll feel it. This is why it's so important to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You're listening to God's voice. God loves people so much. And God will just swing that conversation. And there's a moment that you can minister or give grace or mercy. There's people all around you that need the Lord. You say, God can use me. The answer is yes. It's grace. Don't push people. Invite people. Don't hurt people. Bless people. Moms and dads. This is not inconvenient in your daily schedule. A few years ago, my daughter, she's 16. It's incredible that I have a daughter, three kids. A couple years ago, my, I felt like the Lord said, I want you to know your neighbors. Around my neighborhood, it looks like there's 10, 12 houses. I didn't know there's 52 houses. You know what's a good thing to do? Just drive home different today. Go different roads. You're like, huh, I never noticed that house. I wonder what that man does, what that person does. So there's 52 houses in our little development. And I had this idea, I'm going to introduce myself to them. And so we had a little thing for the church, a little paper for Christmas Eve and candy canes. I said to my daughter, she's probably 14 at the time, let's go. Let's go knock on everybody's door, invite everybody to church. And a candy cane had a little explanation of a candy cane about Jesus or whatever. I'm not sure I believe that, but it said it on there. That'll freak a 14-year-old out. You know what my daughter said? Dad, I'll stay in the car. But she had a piece of paper. I didn't even know people's names. I see people in the neighborhood. I'm like, hey, nice to see you, person, neighbor. You know, I just use these. So I said, I'm going to go and know everybody's name. I'm go knock on the door. Hey, Bree, you want to come? Listen, kids, they're not always in where the dad and mom is, but they're catching it. So I go knock on the door, introduce myself. You know, sometimes there's people that kind of do want to, it's okay. We actually have one house. It's an exact replica of the Miami Vice house. Do you know in Miami Vice, Don Johnson, whatever? It's an exact replica. Every year, it's like a rental house. Somebody's new in there. Dominic Brown, I think, from the Phillies, whatever, he had a couple good years. He rented it. There's always somebody new. My kids call it the murder house. It looks like the perfect place for a murder in that house. But that's part of our story. I'm going to invite you to pray in just a moment, but I'm going to ask you to pray for me. There's a couple neighbors that God's put on my heart. I, during this COVID time, I've opened up our kitchen window so it's a lot bigger. I mean, it's really big. I just like sitting there, and there's one house right there. I've tried to reach my neighbors for years. Nothing. Stone wall. Nothing. I'll text them. Nothing. Nothing. They'll talk about some other stuff that's important to them, and that's fine. I'll see them out and about. I say, oh, God, I know you put them on my heart. Help me to reach them for Jesus Christ. I think it start, first starts in your heart. It's your desire. It's your will. The Lord will show you how to do it after that. I'm not trying to teach you. If it's all about everyone wears the jackets, we would do that. It's not the jackets. It's the Spirit of God that draws people. And we're feeling right now as a pastor, staff, deacons, the Lord is telling us as a church, equip God's people to share the message wherever they go. Give hope. There is good news. And God's got the good news. And we should not be ashamed. The Bible says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For that's the power that transforms people's lives. So ladies and gentlemen, there is good news, but it's not in a political party. It's not in the money. It's not in the fame. It's not in all. It does not satisfy. It's found in Jesus Christ and his power that transforms people's lives. Would you stand with me in the Lord's presence? And you take that communion cup and there's a, there's two sides to it. One is the bread and next is the, the cup. We're going to take communion together. And we're going to sing, what a beautiful name it is. It's the name 
that's above every other name is named Jesus. He's so faithful. He's so good. And after we take communion, I'm going to invite you to come around this altar and you just lift up your hand and say, Lord, I want to be a soul winner. I want to reach people for Christ. I want to invite people. I want to do my part. You're stirring my heart. This is not about the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. And he invites his people to be a witness, to be an ambassador, to be available, to be a friend, to love the world just as he loves the world. The Bible says, for I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you just bow your head for a moment? If you've come here today and you're a broken person, you're a sinner and you're in need of God. When I was praying for the service, I feel like the Lord said, if to somebody watching online or here, if you've been involved in violence and your heart convicts you, condemns you, God forgives you. You've hit somebody, you've hurt somebody, you've bloodied somebody, and it bothers you, the Lord forgives you. Maybe you're a violent man, you're an angry man, you say, Pastor, I can't stop it. God wants to break every bondage in your life, set you free, and make you a man of peace. If you're violent, he could turn you to peace. It's Jesus, the Prince of Peace. If you want to be set free from the bondage of sin, you want to be made whole, you're going the wrong way, you're living the wrong way, you're living the lie, you're angry, you're frustrated, you say, I need a change. The Bible says Jesus is the good news. He gives forgiveness and grace. And he can change your life. There's no one too far from God. You're broken. He can heal you. If you're watching online, I want to tell you, you're not too far from God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. This is real. This is life. This is death. This is grace. This is mercy. God loves you. God gave his son Jesus to wash away all of your sins and give you a fresh new start. There's good news. There's good news. No one's looking around, but whether you're at home or you're in the house, maybe just lift up your hand and say, Pastor, I need Jesus to come into my life. I want to start living for him. Today's my day to live for the Lord. And you want to give your life to Christ. I want to pray for you this morning. I know we have masks on and all this stuff, but today you want to get things right with God. You say, Pastor, I need Jesus. Is there anyone in the house? There's anyone in the house. God loves you. Anyone else? God loves you so very much. He does not want you to go to hell. He does not want you to pay the penalty for your own sin. He died for you so you could have life and eternal life. Is there anyone else? You say, that's me. Pastor, pray for me. I need to get saved. Today's my day. One person, maybe there's someone online maybe at the nine o'clock, but I'm gonna ask us that we'd all pray this simple prayer. You know, you have the bread in your hand. Jesus was pierced, the Bible says, for our transgressions. He was broken. From his side came flood of blood and water. He was broken so you could be healed. In Jesus' name, today God wants to heal you, heal your mind, heal your heart, heal your whole life, give you a brand new life in Christ. He's good like that. Can we all pray together with my friend? But I believe in my heart, Jesus wants the good news to penetrate our heart and set us free. Can we pray, dear Jesus? Come on, let's pray together. Dear Jesus, come into my life and change me. Make me a man of God, a man of peace. I lay down war and receive your forgiveness. Let the blood of Jesus wash away my sins and I follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the bread together with thanksgiving. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. This is the cup in my covenant, my covenant. Excuse me, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, 
you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, with gratitude, with thanksgiving in our heart, your blood washes away all of our sins, satisfies the wrath of God and gives us peace. Oh God, we do this with gratitude in our hearts today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let's take the cup together. Now we're going to start singing what a beautiful name it is. If you want God to use you, especially during this month of December, you come around this altar, social distance, you lift up your hands, say, God, I want you to use me. I want to be involved in spiritual conversations. I want to be an ambassador. I want to be a witness for you. God, I'm available for you. I will invite. I will do what I need to do. I will reconcile. I invite you to come around this altar and just sing and praise God and make yourself available to be used by God in a very special way during this month of December. Come on, let's sing it. Let's lift our hands and glorify his name. Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing come past this. What a beautiful name. above every other name. It's above any political figure, any historical figure, past or present. There is a name that is found in Christ for salvation and salvation alone. There's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. God, call us to be your ambassadors. Call us to be reconciled, not only to you, but to reconcile sinful man with the holy God. Help us to have spiritual conversations. Help us to be willing and available to invite and move forward. Lord, I pray, God, you move upon our hearts this week. That, God, we would see man or woman, a young person, Lord God, with the eyes of Christ for all of eternity. Help us to invite. Help us to be great friends. 
God, help us, Lord, deepen our hearts to be like Christ. Lord, to not talk so much, to die to our will and to win an argument and always to have to be right. Oh God, help us, Lord God, to lay down anything that would be a distraction. And God, I pray that Christ, Lord, in this community would be lifted up and exalted. Lord, if anyone's trying to reach souls for Christ, remind them we can't do it. Lord, let your spirit flow through our life. And I pray, God, that you lead us to people. Open up doors and close doors. God, guide us and lead us. Bring us truth to our hearts and our lives. And God, you told us to share the good news, the gospel. Transform lives, we pray in Jesus' name. And Lord, bless you and keep you. Make your face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night for a prayer service. God bless you. How great is our God today? We are beyond excited that we are in the Christmas season and that God is just doing great things in our church. We have good news and we hope you receive that today. And as we're closing up, we've got a few things that we want to do to give you some next steps. First, I've said it many times, but I'll keep saying it. If God did something big in your life, if you've said yes to Jesus for the first time, if God is speaking to your heart, I'm going to drop our connection card in the chat on the side. I want to encourage you to fill it out. We are thrilled to partner in prayer with you. Second, and this is exciting, Pastor John's announced it, but you can now register for in-person Christmas Eve services by going to our website. We know this is a big day. We love being here. We want to encourage you to sign up early and plan what time it's going to happen. We cannot wait to see you for this epic day. Last but not least, we hope that you join us back online next Sunday or in person. If you'd like to sign up to be in person, we encourage you to go to our website and you can download the forms right there. I'll be in the chat for the next few minutes if you want to keep praying or if there's any need coming through your life. We are so grateful that you chose to be part of Marlton Assembly of God today. We want to pray with you as we close that the Lord bless you and keep you, that the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, that the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We'll see you soon. Bye now.